Right, as soon as you're ready, we're going to get started. Thank you. Okay, it's a little bit after six o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. We'll call the Johnson City Council work session number 22-13 to order. Cindy, roll call, please. Councilmember Martin? Here. Ready? Here. Burkhart? Here. Copes? Evans? We have two items on the agenda this evening. First will be a presentation um, on our sister city relationship with uh, Paya Kosovo and the uh, trip that I recently took to Kosovo, as well as uh, we'll also have discussion regarding the zoning code update. And Dave Wilwarding will be presenting that to us um, as soon as we're finished with the uh, Kosovo presentation. I thought, uh, you know, I, I know that the council members and, and staff have heard me talk about Kosovo and specifically Paya Kosovo now for a number of years. I think that you've all had kind of bits and pieces of what what our sister city relationship is all about and what kind of activities we've been involved in and maybe you know where this might be going. So I thought it might be time to just kind of make a make a short presentation, 15, 20 minutes, kind of do a, a level setting of uh, everybody's knowledge about uh, what it is that we're, what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish uh, with our sister city relationship. And so, Cindy, if you could bring the uh, slide presentation up. We can hold you up. And I thought that I would, um, you know, just cover a couple of two or three areas tonight. First of all, kind of our history, why why we have the sister, sister city relationship with Paya, why why Paya Kosovo, um, some of the activities that we've been involved uh, in, as well as uh, some of the things that that I participated in uh, during the recent trip um, to Kosovo. Um, if you go to the next slide, Cindy. You know, when someone first mentioned to me that we should be considering a sister city relationship with Paya Kosovo, I had no idea what where Kosovo was, what this country was. And I looked at a globe and uh, I couldn't find it anywhere on the globe. And so I thought I would share with you, first of all, a, a map um, that uh, helps you understand where Kosovo is. Um, Kosovo is a small country in the Balkans region of Europe, and it's about the size of eight Iowa counties, so it's a fairly small, small country. It was previously part of the country of Yugoslavia. Um, back in the early 1990s, the countries within US, Yugoslavia started breaking away and declaring their independence. By 1998, what remained of Yugoslavia was Serbia and Montenegro, and Serbia claimed Kosovo as part of its territory. Next slide, Cindy. In 1998, conflict developed in Kosovo between the ethnic Albanians and the ethnic Serbs. Serbia responded with ethnic, ethnic cleansing and genocide. The Serbs began killing the Albanian Kosovars, burning their homes, raping their women, forcing them to flee for their lives into the mountains on the northern part of Kosovo as well as in, into in other countries. NATO intervened in March of 1999 with the support from the United States. In June of 1999, a peace accord was signed and Kosovo was under, the, under UN administration for eight years. On February 17, 2008, Kosovo declared its independence. The United States recognized Kosovo's independence the following day, the day after they declared their independence. It was one of the first nations to do so. I think right now, and the number kind of varies which source you look to, but somewhere around 115 nations do recognize uh, Kosovo's independence. I share this map with you just so that, again, so you can kind of get a sense of where Kosovo is in, in relation to some other, some other um, European um, countries. Next slide. A statue of President Bill Clinton stands on a street that also bears his name in Pristina which is the capital of Kosovo. Clinton was very vocal and supportive of NATO's involvement to end the war in 1999. On the right of this slide, um, you'll see a bust of Madeleine Albright. This was just dedicated in March of this year. And it, uh, it was uh, 
dedicated to represent her role in persuading President Clinton to intervene and end the war in Kosovo. Next slide. This is, a, this is the newborn statue or, or monument that stands in the center of Pristina. It was unveiled on Kosovo's Independence Day to symbolize Kosovo's new independence status. The picture on the right hand lower corner is what it looked like on the day of their independence. What happened was you had thousands of people turn out uh, in, that, in that square and they actually autographed their names on the newborn monument at that time. Every year, the newborn monument is repainted, and this year it has been repainted and named the Winged Women. Um, and in the words of the monument's creator, this year's theme is dedicated to women in two aspects, to the successful women who make us proud around the world by display displaying success in the world of music, culture, film, and sport, but also to those dark parts where women are still victims of domestic violence. And you'll hear as I go through this presentation um, that theme of domestic violence and how they're trying to address that come up several times. The next slide. In March of 2011, the Iowa National Guard entered into a military relationship with the Kosovo Security Forces. From the very beginning, uh, Adjutant General Tim Orr stated the goal of the partnership was to involve the whole of Iowa, the whole of Kosovo. And by, what that, by that, what he meant was that the concept was to develop relations beyond just the military, um, but also to include Iowa and Kosovo cities, schools, and businesses. Next slide. The first step in achieving that whole of Iowa, whole of Kosovo goal occurred in January of 2013. The state entered into a sister state relationship with Kosovo. Governor Branstad traveled to Kosovo to sign the sister, city, sister state agreement uh, along with the president at that time, uh, Adafeti Yayaga. I was on that trip, next slide. And I met with the mayor of Paya, Ali Barisha. Johnson was the first city to enter into a sister city relationship with a city um, in Kosovo. We talked at that meeting about what we hope to achieve in, in a sister city relationship. Next slide. I later traveled to Paya, or at, in April of 2013, Johnson and Paya signed a proclamation creating the sister city relationship. Mayor Ali Barisha traveled to Johnson for that initial uh, signing ceremony. Next slide. I la later traveled to Paya to do the same thing. The partnership agreement, and it's, it's here uh, in, in uh, City Hall, the partnership agreement is written in both English and Albanian. And the agreement sets forth a vision that encourages exchanges between the cities to include representatives of our city governments, schools, business, and youth. Slide. Uh, just a few facts about Paya. Paya is the fourth most populated uh, city in Kosovo. The population is about 96,000. It suffered a very extensive damage. Um, it was it was the city in Paya that suffered the, suffered the most damage and loss of life during the uh, Kosovo War. More than 80 percent of the homes in Paya were damaged or destroyed. Uh, the economies in Paya and Johnson are very similar. They're both based on agriculture, and you can see here some, some of the landscape uh, in Kosovo. It looks very, this, this could be, you know, this could be a scene from, from uh, 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 Iowa's landscape. They're also very focused uh, on their youth and making sure that their youth um, are, are uh, well-educated, as well as they're very supportive of their youth in, in sports activities. Next slide. What Paya does have that we don't have is mountains. <laughs> and they have uh, wonderful mountains uh, on the northern, northern part of the city. And I'll talk a little bit about them again when, we, when I share with you some of the economic development um, activities that we discussed uh, on our recent trip. Next slide. In March of 2018, the Johnson Committee on Paya Kosovo was formed. Uh, one of the activities that the committee has been very involved in, even before they were formally organized, was to every year um, organize a celebration of Kosovo's Independence Day, which is again on February 17. Um, we held them in person prior to the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, we did it virtually. 
And what this slide shows you is one of the things that we did during that celebration in 2021. We hosted what we called a Women of Excellence Conference. And so we identified women here in Iowa as well as in Kosovo to participate um, in this, this virtual conference. And there were, there were hundreds of other women who, you know, who zoomed in to, to listen. But we had women from, from here in Iowa as well as in Kosovo that participated in it. <clears throat> The woman on the lower right is the former president, Yaga, Yayaga, and the uh, young woman on the left is the first Kosovo gold medal winner, um, uh, Mayinda Kelmendi, um, and she, uh, she won her um, gold medal in judo. Judo is a very popular sport um, in Kosovo, and she's from Peya, so we can claim her as one of ours. <laughs> Uh, this year we were back in person again, back at the consulate's uh, offices um, downtown, and we presented to uh, Artan Duraku, who is the chief of mission now at the consulate's office, a, uh, a proclamation recognizing um, their Independence Day as well as our relationship with, with Peya Kosovo. Next slide. Um, another one of the activities that the committee has been very supportive of is the uh, efforts by the Johnson Rotary and the Johnson Police Department to um, fund participation of Johnson youth in Camp Toka uh, in Kosovo. Camp Toka is an international camp, so you have you have kids that participate in that camp from all over the world, not just not just Kosovo. We've had several groups of Johnson uh, youth go there. It's been what they will describe as a life-changing experience for them. Um, and the money is a, 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 quite a bit of the money that is used to help support them in their travels over there it comes from the Smoking Heroes barbecue event that happens every uh, year at, John, uh, at Green Days. Next slide. The Johnson Police Department has also hosted Kosovo Police uh, here in Johnston to exchange information and training techniques, um, focusing particularly on, on community policing. What this uh, picture represents is an effort by the committee last year to collect um, new or gently used sporting equipment to send to Kosovo. Um, Johnson residents and Johnson schools did a, a great job of stepping up and, and collecting all kinds of um, sports equipment. Um, what happened then was that sports equipment was transported over to Kosovo um, by the AAU, and it has been distributed uh, throughout uh, Kosovo, including in Peya, and I'll have a picture here that uh, shows one of the uh, distributions of those uh, of those uh, pieces of equipment uh, on this this last trip that I took over there. Next slide. Um, you know, another thing that we have done over the last nine years, uh, on many occasions, is we've hosted meetings and receptions with Kosovo dignitaries and officials in May, and many of you attended this. We held a reception for the Prime Minister of Kosovo, uh, Alban Kurdi, and several other top officials that were here uh, in Iowa visiting it at the time. Also, uh, earlier this year, we met with a group of Kosovar women who are involved in government at the local level, and they really wanted to learn about how, you know, how we, what we do at the local level in, in our government, and, and uh, they wanted to share experiences on, on how women lead in those kinds of roles. So, uh, on my trip over to Kosovo, uh, earlier in the month of July, uh, I traveled with about 40 other Iowans uh, to, to Kosovo. This was my third trip uh, to the country, and uh, we all saw this as our opportunity to further build on the relationships that we had already developed and that had been interrupted by COVID. There were a couple of years and we just didn't have a lot of uh, interaction with the with Kosovo or the Kosovar people, and so it was kind of, it was time to kind of renew those relationships and see if we couldn't build on what we've already done. During that trip, uh, we met with uh, the Prime Minister, Alvin Kurdi again. You can see uh, him in this picture. He did, uh, in his remarks, uh, make a call out to the city of Johnston and the, and the wonderful reception that we hosted for him here. So he was uh, certainly appreciative of that and, and shared that with everybody in attendance at that meeting. Next slide. We also met with the current president of Kosovo. Um, I'm not gonna get her first name pronounced correctly, but it's something like 
Josa As Asmani, that's her name. She was elected in April of 21, 2021 to a five-year term. She's Kosovo's seventh president. She is Kosovo's second female president. We've got some catching up to do. <laughs> During that trip, uh, Kosovo hosted a local government um, conference, and they invited all of us representing the different cities uh, in Iowa to make presentations on our sister city relationships with, with Kosovo cities. So you had um, representatives from the city of Des Moines, as well as Norwalk, and me presenting on um, our sister city relationships. You had the mayor of Paya, who is our our uh, counterpart, the uh, mayor of Jacoba, I think is is uh, Norwalks, and then the mayor of Pristina, who is Des Moines' uh, counterpart um, in Kosovo, presenting and sharing ideas about how we can can grow the, the relationships that we have. And one of the one of the things, and Artan Daraku, who is the current chief of mission, one of the things that he really challenged us all to do, and I think we all took it very seriously, is that we want to take these relationships to the next level. You know, we've done a good job of building relationships and being friends and being supportive of each other, but now it's something to do, now it's time to do something more that's more tangible in, in what those, those relationships are. So we really focused on um, some of those those kinds of activities. Next slide. So the day after the local uh, government conference, we spent the entire day in Paya. And uh, this was the uh, early morning meeting that we had. It was in the council chambers there. Um, I'm seated in the center there, but off to the right of me, beyond uh, General Orr, is the mayor of, um, of Paya, um, Mahu, Mahu Jerry is his name. Ahead of him is the, what is kind of the equivalent of our, our police chief in the blue uniform, and then the fire chief next to him. Um, one of the things, and let's, let's go to the next slide. One of the things that I presented to them before we met was this list of, of potential, you know, next steps. What can, what can we do now? Uh, in our relationship, how can we kind of grow and, and make this this more meaningful, more tangible? And so I identified these areas that we could uh, uh, do do some additional work around, some more exchanges, um, economic development, youth sports, cultural activities, public safety, as well as schools. And so in this meeting at PEA, we had um, people from their agencies representing all of these areas. And you, you could see in that picture that there were probably about 10 people sitting at the front of the room. Um, in addition to the fire chief and the police chief, we also had the director of uh, youth uh, sports and, and uh, activities, as well as the um, a representative from the University of Paya. So you had several different interests represented in, in talking about what our relationship could be. But, but sitting, sitting on this side were probably about 40, 40 individuals that were staff of, uh, of the mayor's office. And so they were, they were part of that discussion and, and part of that listening that we had that day. So um, kind of building on some of what we talked about, we talked about economic development and, uh, you know, I suggested and, and there was, there was um, some agreement on it that, you know, one area that we can really um, grow our relationship is around tourism and working with them to, to see if we can't help them build their tourism industry. They've got these wonderful mountains, the Rogova Mountains. Um, on the north side of the city where they do they have you know skiing and hiking and zip lining and several of the group that went to went to Kosovo from Iowa did the zip lining. I did not but others others did uh, what's that oh. <laughs> my excuse was I had a dress on <laughs> I had an excuse <laughs> So they have, you know, these wonderful mountains with all kinds of uh, vacation um, opportunities. They also have lots of, next slide, Cindy, lots of historical sites. I mean, Inpea is this 
um, uh, Serbian Orthodox Church that was built in the 1300s um, that is just absolutely beautiful on the inside and outside. It's, it was actually a monastery. Now, now nuns um, uh, occupy the building. The tree off to the left, I'm just going to share this with you. That tree is an 800-year-old mulberry tree. And I made it a point to eat some of the fruit from that tree. Because I thought, you know, this, if there's anything that will, you know, uh, make my life longer, it'll be eating from an 800-year-old mulberry tree. They also have lots of different museums um, in, in Kosovo, including in Peja. This is just a picture of a, a recently opened museum um, that is called... It's a, it's a children's museum, and it recognizes, or it's dedicated to the children who died during the war. And there were about 2,000 children um, that died during the war. Um, once, I, I think the name of it is uh, Once, again, uh, Once Upon a Time, Never Again. And it, you know, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's heartbreaking, um, but it's also, you know, it's important to share their stories so that, you know, so that those, those things don't happen happen again. But there's all different kinds of, um, you know, museums, art museums, um, museums that hold art, artifacts that are, you know, go to go, go back to before Christ. Um, so again, lots of opportunities for tourism in Kosovo. Next slide, Cindy. And they also have lots of uh, public art. Uh, a lot of the public art that you're going to see, you know, has, relates to, um, to the war. This is a brand new piece of sculpture that they have um, in Pristina. It's called Heroines, and it's dedicated to um, the women who were heroes during the war, as well as, again, those who were raped um, or sub subjected in some way to some sort of domestic violence. It's made up of, yeah, I, I kind of implanted that other picture there, it's made up of coins of that has imprinted on it that, that same picture. So that's what the entire sculpture is made up of. A couple of other things that uh, I did while I was there that pr uh, present some economic development opportunities. A group of us met with the Kosovo Insurance Bureau and uh, learned more about how they regulate insurance companies in um, Kosovo, and they're very interested in Iowa insurance companies being involved in, in uh, providing insurance coverage in Kosovo. Next slide. I also met with the Pristina Chamber of Advocates, or the name is something like that. It's their bar association, the Pristina Bar Association. And you can see that there were several women in that meeting. And again, uh, what they're proposing is that they enter into some sister relationships with either the Iowa State Bar Association or the Polk County Women's Bar Association. Uh, they're really interested in learning more about how we handle domestic violence cases. You know, what is our procedure? How do we you know, prosecute them? Uh, how do we investigate them? Again, domestic violence is something that seems to be um, a focus of a lot of attention in, in Kosovo right now. Next slide. While we were in Peja, they have this brand new um, music school. And uh, this young man that uh, played the piano, even though the piano was a little bit out of tune, um, he did an incredible job. And I told him afterward that, you know, he, he, his, his fingers moved faster than I can think. I mean, he just did an amazing job. Again, another opportunity for some youth exchanges cultural exchanges. Uh, they've got very talented uh, young people there, and we've got, obviously, here in Johnston, wonderful music programs. It would be great to, to do some um, exchange, youth exchanges in the uh, whole area of performing art and music. We also, this was not in Pea, this was in Koba, but we delivered some of those volleyballs that were collected during you know that effort by um, by our committee here in Johnson, as, as well as others, delivered it to a club of uh, young uh, ladies, girls, um, who play volleyball. And we spent an hour tossing the balls around with them. And uh, really, uh, they, they got a kick out of it, and, and uh, we did as well. So lots of opportunities. You know, volleyball is a, is a huge sport there. Soccer, of course, is. Um, we're trying to get them more interested in baseball. Um, I think we'll get there. Um, 
course, they, they play some basketball as well. But anyway, lots of opportunities for some um, uh, youth sports exchanges. We also met with the uh, uh, Paya Rotary. While we were in Paya, uh, the Paya Rotary has had some conversations in the past with the Johnson Rotary about, you know, how can we collaborate on some projects um, together so we kind of re reignited um, those, those conversations. And one of the immediate things that they asked us if we could help them do, and if you go to the next slide, Cindy, they have been uh, promised a piece of um, uh, the World Trade Center, a piece of the steel from the World Trade Center to create a memorial um, in, in, the, in one of the Paya Parks in recognition of our uh, September 11th event. And uh, they were asking us if there wasn't a way that we could help them get that piece of um, steel delivered before September 11th of this year so they could actually have the monument constructed by then. This is just a representation of what it's going to look like um, in some uh, quick conversations with the Johnston Rotary, um, as well as with uh, our Johnston PAYA committee. Uh, we were coming up, we were brainstorming, and we'd actually found a, a way to get this deal over uh, to PAYA uh, in time for it to be placed. Um, in the meantime, the uh, New York Fire Department stepped up to the plate and said they'd ship it over. So it's, it's on its way um, to uh, PAYA and uh, they fully expect to have the you know, dedication of the monument on September 11th of this year. So, again, I just wanted to uh, recognize a couple of people who uh, provided some of the pictures that I've, I've shared with you today. But I would just say, you know, in conclusion, um, you know, this, <laughs> I've, I've said it many times before, you know, the Kosovo people are incredible people. They're, they're, you know, we talk about Iowa nice, they are Kosovo nice, you know, a thousand times over. They could not be more appreciative of what we did um, to help them end the war and save their lives. And I can't tell you how many times while I was in Kosovo, a Kosovar would come up to me and say, you know, we, 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 we love America, we love Americans. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be alive today. And when somebody says that to you, it just sends chills. Down your down your spine. So um, these are these are wonderful people. They deserve um, our friendship, and they deserve our um, you know our willingness to to work with them to continue to help um, you know grow their their uh, their country uh, into the democracy that they they really dream that it can be. So I would just encourage you know all of you if you have any questions to the extent you want to be you know, involved in the committee or in some of these activities that I've described today, just let me know because, you know, we, we can use all the help we can, we can get to, uh, to um, you know, to make sure that some of the things that we talked about, have talked about in the past, talked about here uh, in the month of July with our, with our Kosovo friends that you know, we can make those become a reality. So I did that in a little more than 20 minutes, but any questions? I know that was a quick tour, a lot of information, but again, happy to talk to you anytime, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do there. I would also commend to you, I learned about this book when I was in Kosovo, Beyond the Mountains of the Dam. Um, it's written by uh, a war reporter, Matthew McAllister, who was with, uh, I forget the, uh, not Newsweek, but um, oops, some media, media group. Anyway, he traveled into Kosovo during the war. He wrote this book, and it really centers around Paya. And so if you want to learn more about what they were experiencing, not only in Kosovo generally during the war, but in Paya in particular, this is a great book that describes it, and it's an easy read. I, 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 I read fairly slow, but I got it done in four days just sitting down. So it's, it's very, it, um, you, it's, um, it's a great book, and I would recommend it to you. Anyway, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. 
And that is a discussion <coughs> regarding the zoning code update. Clayton? Good evening. First off, great presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, hearing the 1300 year old building and the old 100 year old tree gives me optimism that the things we do today may be around for that long as well. <laughs> so uh, good. it's a good segue into the topic of zoning code update there. Um, we have several items that I don't believe you've seen before. I'm not going to go through them in detail unless you want me to, but just want to kind of give a highlight that we're we got some uh, direction on the mixed use zoning districts, special zoning districts and overlay districts, um, kind of the general chapters that then would reference back to other sections we've been working through and that you've seen in the past. I believe we've talked about transportation and access management several times before. Stormwater and the adoption process though, I don't believe we have touched on in detail or at all. So that may be an area to put some focus. Um, I'm gonna start with the stormwater uh, just as a general overview. Uh, really, we're looking to adopt a similar standard to what uh, many of the metro communities are doing through the capital crossroads process. We don't really anticipate much of a change when it comes to water quality and the volume that has to be treated there, um, where there will likely be a change is when it comes to water quantity events, that's the higher flow events, uh, sites will likely need to obtain about approximately 10% less. And the main reason for that is uh, they'll be detaining based on a like for like storm. Uh, currently we detained everything back to a five year event. This would allow them to detain a 25 year event to a 25 year event. So that changes how they release water and it's intended to mimic the natural flow of water and the natural hydrology uh, more properly than we currently do. And then the adoption rezoning process, we um, are starting to get towards the end of the uh, zoning code. So we're, you've seen most of all the items and there's still a few chapters we have yet to get in front of you, but we need to start thinking about how we're going to uh, end this process and become make adopt this as final. Uh, so we kind of envision that the adoption would all be as one, and then we would follow that up with several rezonings. And that would be necessitated because there are several zoning districts that we are looking to eliminate wholesale. And then those properties would get rezoned to an appropriate zoning district of similar nature. And then there are, is the next step of also the PUDs. We have identified uh, a new number of them that just are no longer necessary. A uh, common theme we found in the PUDs that we've reviewed is they included a lot of one-time development items, update this existing road, for example. They could have been addressed through a development agreement, not a PUD, and it just makes uh, implementation and administration of the zoning code more difficult when we have multiple documents we have to search through. So we would look to eliminate or uh, modify a, a number of those PUDs to make it the administration more streamlined. So one item that we have interest in getting some feedback on um, specific to the rezoning process is do we just pull the mandate off, do it all at once, one meeting, probably not the most feasible because you likely have multiple people here, or do we split it up into uh, smaller subsections such as we'll do the residential districts this meeting and then the commercial districts the next meeting. We did provide a uh, uh, two maps showing the districts that are going to be eliminated and need rezoned. Um, this is not getting into PUDs um, to really kind of give you an indication of how they're geographically spread and the number of properties that are being impacted. And in the grand scheme of things, it's not a significant number that will need to get rezoned in the vast majority of them, they're not really losing anything. It's just a change maybe in naming, uh, some minor modifications to their thing, to their uh, zoning regulations, but it really shouldn't, should have minimal impact on their ability to utilize their property. So we're hopeful that will uh, ease any concerns that residents and landowners may have when they get noticed that their property would be rezoned. 
So with that brief introduction, I'll stop there. We can go into any specific section that you may have uh, highlighted that you'd like to address, answer any questions you may have. And we, both David and Aaron are also here tonight as well. Clayton, why don't you pose your question again and get the feedback that we need on um, either doing it all in one big piece or breaking it up. We want to rezone both the commercial properties and the residential properties at one time. So they would just go through one rezoning process. Or do we want to change in the interim to the rezoning process? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The, well, so you'll, you'll have the separate adoption of the code, and then we'll follow, that'd be a three reading process. And then either simultaneous to that or immediately thereafter, we would do another ordinance, three readings to rezone those properties to the appropriate district. So for example, the R190 zoning district is proposed to be eliminated, and we propose those properties be rezoned to the R175 zoning district very minimal changes to their property, but that would be an example of one. And our thought process was, if we split them into commercial versus residential, they're gonna have different natures of concerns. You know, a residential landowner probably is only has one property, most likely a commercial property owner. They may have multiple properties spanning multiple districts that have different interests. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has an opinion, but. I would I would suggest that we do do them separately. That way, whoever is in attendance is is focused on just you know that that piece of it, yep. and we don't have uh, confusion perhaps resulting because you have people talking both residential and commercial. Um, I, we may not. I mean, what what kind of comment do we expect on either? Uh, hopefully with a strong, robust uh, public education and outreach in advance of this, hopefully minimal. Yeah. Um, and that's on our list to prepare for you a proposal for how we're going to outreach this. Um, probably need to go a little, probably need to go above our normal uh, notices, get involved with our communications department, make sure our residents really know what's going on. Right. Right. Uh, so we may not have a lot of public input even. That's the goal Yeah. Right? Exactly. or the hope. <laughs> One, I think it would be good for us to have some sort of public comment on that. Oh, yeah. So I just, that was, I just want to make sure that it's there. And two, I, do, I agree that doing them separately might be best because I think we try to put too much into one that um, it might cause the other side to have issues. And we'd probably split the PUDs in a similar manner commercial PUDs and residential PUDs for similar. So you'd have four categories, most likely. Any other thoughts? Good note on page 11 and 12 of the memo, there's a map that shows the properties that are anticipated to need to be rezoned through through the standard zoning process. This doesn't, that doesn't include the PUDs. Um, and then as, as Clayton said, they're generally kind of not a significant amount and they're generally kind of clumped together. Um, so that just gives you a sense of where those are, where those are located. We do anticipate from a timing perspective, adoption of the code happening at, at one period of time, but having an, an, an enactment date or a start date of a of later date. And we'd like to lay those out so that all of these types of rezonings would occur in coordination with that effective date of that zoning change. So we're not to help, help burden the load of the council during you know the various different hearings, but then also give people time to to know this is coming and this is the date it will actually take effect. So that's kind of our, our goal and our plan as of right now. And as Clayton said, we'll be developing a, a more thorough sort of public education plan to make sure we're um, helping educate and get the word out and answering questions that people have ahead of all of those hearings. When do you expect, expect that that will happen? Um, we're getting close to getting it all together. Um, I would hope uh, late fall, early winter, we'd be starting that process. Our original goal was, gee, it would be great to have it effective January 1. Well, January 1 is going to be here <laughs> before we know it. Um, so my, my personal target um, would be having an effective date in, in spring, you know, March 1st, April 1st, somewhere around there kind of would be a goal. 
Um, and I, I think that's achievable. We're, we're very close. Um, we've got a few chapters to get back to yet, a couple of the bigger ones that there might be more conversation on subdivision regulation signage. Um, make sure you're all comfortable with the direction that's heading there. And then um, you know, right now it's a scattering of many, many chapters all separately. We've got to put it all together and, and give it a good review and, and make sure you all have time to do that as well. So um, adoption starting late fall, early winter, and hopefully in a, you know, an effective date in early spring. That's a good time of the year for public education. People can't get out of their houses. <laughs> Sit around and read mundane zoning laws. Clayton, you mentioned that. Oh, sorry. You mentioned that you're just trying to zone commercial and the residential in it. Same kind of thing for storm control. Is that what you said? Storm management? Yeah, so they would be, they'd probably be on a very similar time frame, but just approved separately so that they're not at the same meeting. Is that what you. Okay. That's all I wanted. I'm hoping that you keep the thought the process there is a residential homeowner probably has different interests in zoning law than a commercial landowner. I just have one uh, request. I've been getting a fair number of questions from the tree board regarding uh, the lists that they're supposed to be presenting as part of the updated ordinances on nuisance trees or recommended trees, et cetera. And there's been some confusion. So um, perhaps uh, outside this meeting, we could have either a Zoom or even an in-person discussion and invite uh, the tree board or, or maybe Virginia Solberg from the tree board, who is one of the people that are supposed to be working on the list to get that, you know, to get, get it straightened out exactly what is needed. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, we can get a meeting arranged and we can send up a follow-up email. I think we need to do that because like I said, there's confusion um, and I and I don't want to get into it at, at this point. It just it just needs to be cleared up. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, we can schedule something for that. Um, at your beginning of your comments, you talked about um, stormwater standards um, and this capital crossroads and that whole process. I was just trying to look through the document that you were, was attached to try to find that information, but I couldn't really find it. Could you give me like a page or which? Yeah. So which I thought I had those bookmarks, but for some reason those must not have saved. So I'm well, there's a bookmark. For myself, I'm struggling as well. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I thought I had those bookmarked. It's chapter, it's chapter 87, yeah. and it looks like it starts on page 50 of the PDF. I, uh, the only the attachment has chapter 196 and chapter 191 because I bookmarked it so I don't know what chapter I don't know what page 50 you're looking, looking at the a, memo that was attached 87. to the agenda yeah mm -hmm. page, page 50 80. starts chapter 87 I'm but sure. the page 50 you'd have to scroll to it I thought I had those bookmarked but apparently I didn't save those bookmarks so that was my error in preparing the agenda item. So this is chapter 87, and in the index, it refers to chapter 196 and chapter 191. So maybe the index is just wrong or? Yeah, that's what I was saying. I, I made an error there and okay. didn't, get the, okay. didn't get the index correct. I thought I had done it, but I must okay, not have okay, hit save okay, or something. Okay, okay. Thank you. So a minor detail I'll point to on the stormwater. Um, currently, stormwater management, grading and erosion control, uh, stormwater utility, storm sewers, they're kind of scattered throughout our code of ordinances right now. So we're proposing to relocate them all to the chapters 85 to 89 so that someone looking for information related to stormwater, grading, things of that nature, they're not having to search in multiple places, hopefully. Um, ho goal there is to try and make the code a little more user friendly. So I, as I, I scrolled through several pages, it was chapter 87, and then you get to a new document that is labeled 142.06 specifications. That's part of chapter 87 and 
we are trying to decide where that portion lives because that's not probably something that needs to be in the code specifically, but those are kind of our design specifications. Because I mean, I mean, from a, it doesn't appear that, I mean, by the numbering, it doesn't appear that it's part of chapter 87. Yeah, and I think that, again, I must not hit save. So I apologize for that. It, no, I'm just, again. But it's supposed to be part of chapter 87. Yeah, this is As drafted, it just didn't get. Yeah, it's just hard to kind of follow the, because the numbering it isn't consistent, right? Yeah, understood. And that 142 section is likely going to get pulled out of the code itself and put into a separate technical manual. So where in the in this chapter 87 are the changes that are kind of being generated by the capital crossroads process? Where would those show up? Seven oh three is where the bulk of it is gonna be located. So I, is and really a lot of this is very, we, a lot of it is common practice of now, but it's much more written and specified here than current uh, regulations. So, so as I just scrolled through 8703, I don't see any indication like any red lines or any change in our current text if i were to redline our current change i'd be crossing out one paragraph essentially that's pretty much our text so this is all essentially brand new so this is all new this is all brand new okay, okay. new for code not necessarily new for practice okay so our our current code is we were ahead of the time when it was adopted significantly ahead of the time um and so we um there wasn't a lot of guidance at the time when we changed our standards. That goes back 2007, I think, around there. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of progress from stormwater, you know, from a regional perspective, from a statewide perspective, as far as the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual wasn't adopted yet when we adopted our changes to our stormwater code. Um, and so our current code is very, as Clayton said, very short. Um, but it gives us the latitude to in enforce essentially what's now the Iowa Stormwater Management Manual. Um, as the cro Capital Crossroads went through, we participated in that process, and a lot of that process um, were cities trying to get up to that standard, and as we looked at it, there were some things that we actually were a little over-restrictive on and needed to come back to, and most of them were pretty consistent with what we were doing. So the code looks much different than it looks today, but in practice, the real change is that change to the, the um, water quantity requirements um, that actually gives the designers a little bit more flexibility. Um, we'll reduce the footprint a little bit of, of you know, the standard detention basin, um, but we'll coincide with sort of how the rest of the metro will be handling um, handling those requirements going forward. So as I'm looking at 8703, and you're talking about water quantity, where would that be inside of this 8703? Um, for the adoption of specifications cover it doesn't won't actually call that specifically out but that's where that re, it'll refer back to the uh, Iowa Stormwater Management Manual okay as Thank well you. as six covers it a little bit One area that's new that we don't currently have any guidance on and we've struggled to figure out is, um, since we're all looking at that, number 10 and um, addresses redevelopment sites. Um, and so this gives us a, a specific standard of when stormwater needs to kick in based on what redevelopment you're doing on your site. And, and 10,000 square feet of sort of change is kind of the, um, the standard that Capital Crossroads is, is, has recommended and that what we're proposing here. Um, we're pretty much silent on that right now, and so you could read it one way that we'd have to incorporate all the stormwater requirements for any little change on the site, or you could, in, you know, in, interpret it that there's a lot more leeway there. And so we've kind of historically kind of landed somewhere in the middle, but this will give us more specific guidance. Thanks, I appreciate kind of a little deeper dive on that.
Anything else, Clay? There's specific areas you want to dive into. I don't think we need to belabor the topic tonight. Council, have any other? Does the council have any other questions or comments for Clayton? Thank you for welcome, Clayton. Thanks, Clayton. Thank you. That completes our agenda for the work session this evening. Jim is not here to give us an update on staff comments. So is we we'll have a couple of scheduled staff comments. I'm not sure. Let's do it. Have a successful 2021-2022 fiscal year for the homeowner grant program. Numbers here. We had a total of 26 applications. We approved 23 of those. That resulted in uh, the city paying out $9,275.95. For, and there was a total project value of $31,029.56. So that equates to the city doing just shy of 30% of the total value of all those projects. The projects included 16 rain barrels, one rain garden, one erosion control project. That was probably the big one of the year and incorporated three separate properties for a drainage channel. We had three soil quality restoration projects as well. And those were spread out pretty evenly amongst the the community and I provided you a map of where those were if you were interested in that. And then I also provided a highlight of some of the ma main projects that we did. I didn't give you pictures of all the rain barrels. <laughs> uh, one of the early projects we had was a rain garden on Morningside Circle. It was treating the roof drainage from the existing home and it's designed to incorporate the one and a quarter inch rain event and it seems to be a pretty Pretty functioning design they did there, uh, pushed out from the home. I don't have any before pictures there because it'd just be their yard. There were the three soil quality restoration projects. I only showed you an example of one since they all look very similar in nature. That's where you do the aeration of the yard, spread compost. After about two weeks, that soil will work itself into the aeration holes and then grass will just retake and you'll never know something happened, but that promotes the infiltration of water and a healthier root structure on your lawn to allow for a more rain absorption. So we had three of those projects throughout the community. The big project we had was out on 107th Street and Beaverbrook Boulevard. There was a drainage channel kind of running diagonally from 107th to Beaverbrook Boulevard and it was experiencing some significant erosion. And can be, yeah, you can kind of see it really cut down into that property. This was the, probably the worst part of the drainage channel. It was, uh, that fence was at risk of collapsing into the drainage channel. And that pipe poking out was their sump pump line for one of the houses. Uh, no public infrastructure was at risk with this. It was all private infrastructure. And they did a pretty significant regrading of that drainage channel, armored the banks of that to um, stop additional flow. There, on that top picture, right at the inlet, that's pretty much taking all the drainage from Grimes Park and that development over in Grimes. So they're receiving a lot of water that's outside of our jurisdiction. So they tried to mitigate on that first uh, oxbow or bend they had there so that they're not getting the of flow that there. Then there was kind of this secondary channel that you can kind of see in the midpoint that was taking rear yard drainage from a few homes. So they kind of graded that and incorporated that confluent a little bit better there. A couple more pictures. That project um, was a total of about $9,500 for them to do all that work. And we contributed just shy of 40% of that total project. 
I gotta say, I was quite surprised at how affordable they were able to get that project done. Me too. That's a lot of riprap. Yeah, it is. For, Especially when I saw the end product, I was like, how I mean, did you, how did you mean, pull this price yeah, off? Right, but, right, right. They must know somebody who's in the rock business. <laughs> but it, it was an area that was in desperate need of some attention and that end product will certainly help stabilize that stream, prevent that downstream mitigation, uh, migration of soils and improve that downstream water quality. So that, that's a highlight of the big projects we had this year. Uh, happy to go into further detail or answer questions if you have any. Uh, you have refunded the program for 2022, 2023, and we've be already begun getting some applications in. So there remains a seems to be a strong interest still in this program, and our residents certainly are taking advantage of it. Clayton, two questions. Yes. Thank you for that showing up. This is really good. So, how long have you been doing this? This was our sixth year. Yeah, our sixth year. Six years. Yeah. And how, what has been the trajectory? It's going up, down, level? Uh, it seems to be pretty level. Level. Okay. Yeah. Not, and you're funding at the same level all year, all the six years? Uh, the funding amount increases annually, uh, marginally. Um, I could certainly get you guys uh, kind of like a five year or six year breakdown of how we've done over the long term, if that's of interest to you. Right. So you can kind of see how, how it's been progressing. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great information to know. I'm just trying to wonder if we need to fund it more or fund it less, trying to see what way the trajectory is going. More interest, less interest? That we can know better. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can pull that information pretty quick and get that sent out but in an email to the group. That'd be great. Thanks. Clayton, how do we share this information with our residents to give them some ideas of you know what they can uh, be doing? We're there? advertising this program in our water bills, newsletter, Johnston Living, various community events we're participating in, uh, word of mouth. Uh, we as a metro, there's many communities that have very similar programs, and we all have kind of utilized the same form that has the information for each other's communities sure. in it. So uh, we try and give other, work with other communities. One thing I notice, like at the farmers market or kites on the green, the number of people that attend those events that aren't even Johnstown residents uh, is great, um, but then they. Uh, they, they hear, oh, this is for Johnson residents. They go, oh, man, I can't take advantage of this. Well, where do you live? Oh, I live in West Des Oh, well, they have a program. Here's their information. And they likewise do very similar things. So uh, I, I think, you know, I was thinking of um, when my kids were younger, there's this deal where it's called the Central Iowa Railroad deal. And so these are people who have built like model railroad, outdoor model railroad around usually a pretty significant landscape feature. And they had this deal, like there was like the first Saturday in August and you could, there was like six or eight of them and you could go around and tour all of them. And I, I wonder if that might be kind of, I mean, you look at all these kind of projects, I think it might be kind of a neat thing to try to maybe try to do a, pick a Saturday and, and I, you know, and obviously get the, the homeowners to agree to kind of open up and kind of have a little refreshments at the sites and people could kind of go around and, we, you know, do a little bit of, I think there might be some value in trying to, trying to do that. I mean, I, obviously, you, you know, it's, there's a, would be a little bit of staff time or trying to maybe figure out maybe the, uh, a board or a park, the park board or the tree board might be willing to help pull that together because obviously there's some benefit with, with that. So I, I think finding some way to promote these projects a little bit more and getting people to physically see them, I think might be something. And I, I believe we discussed that kind of as a metro community because I think we need to incorporate some other communities to get enough projects to make it meaningful for people. We might not have enough examples locally that, but if you incorporate Urbandale, Clive, West Des Moines, yeah. might get enough there. So that's something we can certainly coordinate with kind of the larger metro group um, uh, to try and sure. spark some interest. Yeah. If anything, it's good public education. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Anything else, Clayton? That's all I had on this topic. Okay. Well, you took us up to uh, our ending time, so thank you for doing that. Welcome. So why don't we go ahead and uh, adjourn the city council work session.
We need to take a break. Okay. Start up the regular.